Some people just pray, I pray, and my eye do not know what to preach on. So, in the Bible study, if you can find it, last time I did 2 Peter chapter 3. So I thought, do I do that again? But there's some people who have already did, so I thought it wasn't going to work. So I just flipped the page, and I thought, what's next in the book? And it was First John in the book, chapter 1. And I read it, and I thought, oh, that's really good. So this morning, we're going to read First John chapter 1. A bit of context, obviously, for the first chapter, so we need to understand the reason, the reason for the letter. Um, so the author is John. However, there's no mention of his name, any other names, places, or events in this letter. Yet we know that the author was an eyewitness to Jesus, as, as verses 1 to 3 say, which we'll get to. So even though the letter is broad to its audience, it still feels very personal to the hearer and to the reader. As John constantly uses the word we, and this is important, this letter is, was written to Christians. So if you're not a Christian here this morning, this doesn't have to apply to you. However, I hope at the end of it, you will see the benefits of what the following Jesus is. So this is a letter to Christians. So the scholars believe that it was written around AD 85, 90 from Ephesus, uh, when John was an older man. An important note to the readers, so Jesus died and resurrected around 33. This letter was written about 50 years after that event. So the people in e Ephesus might not have been eyewitnesses because it was another generation. So those people potentially are in the same boat as us. We've never seen Jesus so the question is, do we believe what John wrote? So as we read this, the first challenge to us all is, do we as Christians believe what John is saying? So we're going to read, we're going to read 10 verses, and then we're going to see what this passage is hopefully saying to us all. So it should come on the screen. So chapter verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have walked at and talked with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write, so that our joy may be made complete. And then, we going to say on yet. This is the message we have heard from him, and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie, and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And we call the title of this, The Joy of Fellowship. We'll have a quick prayer, then we'll see what this passage has to say to us all. Lord, as we read this passage, we pray, Lord, that you'll soften our hearts, make us be present in this moment, remove any distractions, remove any barriers. I pray, Lord, that you'll let us all look into our own hearts, and I pray, Lord, that we will be filled with your joy. As Christians, we should be the most joyful people in the world. However, as we read this passage, there can be blockings, and we can reduce our joy in our lives. God is waiting for us. He's patient. His arms are open wide. I pray, Lord, that as we read this passage, you will draw people to you, and you will restore people, and you will and help people grow. And I pray, Lord, that you will fill us all with joy at the end of this.
this service. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we get into it, a few questions for you all and myself. When do you feel full spiritually? When do you feel the most joyful? What do you do to produce these? When was the last time you were full of joy? On the flip side, are circumstances in life robbing you of your joy? Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, so we need to water, feed, and take care of ourselves spiritually to produce it. And in a very simple way, joy is a choice. If you're a Christian, and it's a fruit of the Spirit, it's a choice. So you can have a little joy, or you can be full of joy, and that's what we'll get to this morning. So the aim of this message is to encourage us all and increase our joy. So we're going to dive into this passage now. Dive. So we're going to read 10 verses and we're going to try and unpack it and see what God is trying to say to us all. So we're going to look at verse 1 first. Verse 1. So what was from the beginning? So the introduction is the same or similar introduction to the Gospel of John, verse 1. It won't come on the screen, but you all probably know it. John wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John was looking back at Genesis 1, which says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So John is obviously trying to emphasize something to his readers about the beginning. So something, which we don't know yet, was in the beginning, which means the something is eternal. So let's see what that something is. So what we have heard, now the we, now it's either John was referring to the we as him and the apostles, or he referred to we as a um, congregation of believers. So I'm not sure which, but the, the uses the term we quite a lot, which is quite a, a personal writing to a group of people. So, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at. So, the heard, seen with our eyes, looked at, touched with our hands, this is a person. So, John is saying, a person was from the beginning, yet came to earth in his day physically and could talk and yet hands because he touched his hands. And what was it concerning? Concerning the word of life. The word is a Greek word called logos and it's the same word used in John 1 and it's about a divine expression or it can mean reason. So the reason of life and who that is we all will get to shortly. So this is very important. John is not describing a vision or a thought that just popped in his head. He's explaining a real life encounter in his lifetime a true eyewitness account along with others. This should give us all hope that our faith is based on the fact that John touched the hands of God in the flesh. So who here is with John? So our faith is built upon this foundational truth. So we're going to look at verse 2 now. So who is John describing? We're going to look at verse 2 now which reads, and the life, the same word, the reason, the logos, was manifested. Manifested means can mean appear or declare or show. And we, again, it's very repetitive, these first few verses. And we have seen and testified. So he's repeating the eyewitness account. And the testify is something that would hold up in court. So he's telling the truth. And proclaim, so what John is saying is, he's not keeping quiet, he's saying what I, someone has revealed to me, I am proclaiming to other people. He's proclaiming to you, us, the eternal life, again the same from verse 1, from the beginning, uh, eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So this person was in the beginning, yet the person is distinct to God the Father, um, and it says manifested to us, again, John has repeated that this person has appeared to John and other people. 
So obviously you know John is describing Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus is the word of life from verse 1. And Jesus is also the reason to life. And John 14, 6 says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus speaking. No man comes to the Father uh, except through the Son. So Jesus is the reason to life. The world will probably tell you there's other reasons to life, but yet as a Christian we know the only reason and purpose that our existence is to have a relationship with God through Jesus. So Jesus is the reason of life. So a challenge to us all, just like John, do we pro proclaim this truth to people like John? Again, John tried to Christians. So as Christians, are we encouraging each other? Um, so somebody might be down in the fellowship. So are we texting that person? Are we ringing that person? There might be some new Christians that we know. Are we helping them grow in the faith? Um, are we just sending it at scripture to people? There's lots of things that we can do. Um, our hope is in Jesus. So no matter what we are going through in life, we can trust that this eyewitness account is true. And Jesus cannot change. So the world changed its beliefs day after day after day. But we can trust and hope that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let's carry on and look at verse 3 now. Verse 3. Verse 3. Again, super repetition. What we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you. So we certainly try to emphasize this point. And if there's repetition in scripture, it's that God is trying to tell us something because no doubt we're all very forgetful. So we have a constant repetition of what John is trying to emphasize. So what is John proclaiming to us because of, as believers? So what is John proclaiming to us? What are the truths of the eyewitness accounts? So it says, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Now we're going to look at the word fellowship. If you go down, please be. Fellowship, which is quite an important one. Um, scroll a bit down, please. There we go. Fellowship. So it's the Greek word, koinonia, if that's how you say it. And it could mean a partnership, participation, communion, or fellowship. And I, I quoted um, somebody on what this word meant, and it says, open quotes. The Greek word, Koinonia is derived from the word koinos, which very literally means common, in the sense of being shared by all. The use of the word in Acts 2.44, now all who believed were together and had all things in common, is very helpful. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. The word common is the ancient Greek word koinonia. So what does this mean? It's about sharing the blessings. It's about unity. It's about togetherness, brotherly love, joy, happiness. And these all come through the good news of Jesus. Again, we haven't seen Jesus physically. However, we can enjoy the same fellowship that John had with Jesus. So that's what the word fellowship means. And we'll come more to that book. Please keep that in mind. It's a very close bond of togetherness. So we're going to we go ahead and keep to the next carrying the verse that says, so that we too may have fellowship with us, meaning us as a group, and indeed our fellowship, same word, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So the same unity and love that we share is not just with one another but with the Father and the Son, the Word of life, the eternal being, who is Jesus. Jesus came to earth to restore man's fellowship to God. He made the way possible. But I think in the Son, we can have a close relationship with the Creator of the universe. And that's what God wants for every person. And that's why we were created. It's a bit of a confusing and hard thing to get head around. It's a horizontal relationship with each other, yet it's a vertical relationship with God.
or all at once, which is a bit hard to get my head around, but yeah, that's what the word says. So have you ever had it where you could meet a person for the brand new time? It's suddenly you say you're a Christian, yet you have an automatic bond, you have a connection because you believe the same things. You, you don't know anything of the past, but if you say you're a born again believer, suddenly it's like your connection struggle and you feel like you've known the person for a while. That's what we're trying to get through. It's a deep relationship with God and with, with each other. All things are in common. And I want to go there actually. I wasn't planning on doing it, but I'm going to go to Acts, not on the screen. I'm going to go to Acts chapter 2. Because when we did the Bible study, the phrase of like togetherness and unity kept going up a lot. And they were getting blessings, there were obviously thousands coming to believe. So surely there's a connection between us being a, as a, as a, in unison as a fellowship with growth. Um, so I'm going to read Acts chapter 2. I'm going to go to the book and see what I'm going to read. In Acts 2, I'm going to read from 37 and see where I get to. So Acts 2, 37 reads, Now when they heard this, the gospel, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exalting them, saying, Be saved from this, this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. And this is the important bit. So 3,000 were, it says, 42 says, they were, as in the believers, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, which we're doing now, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, which we're doing after. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Important point 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. So there's a, it, it was all in one accord, it was all together. I'm not saying we have to go and sell everything and divvy it out, but there was a sense that they all had the same goal, there was unity, there was togetherness, and then there, was, there were thousands that were growing into the body of Christ. So I asked the question, are we an Acts 2 church? So do we love each other like we did in Acts chapter 2? Um, is our relationship daily with God and each other, or is our relationship an hour on a Sunday? So I pray that this touched our hearts and we become more like an Acts chapter 2 church. So what is John's reason for this letter? So we're going to look at this in verse 4. Verse 4 we're going to now. What is John's reason for this letter? And this is the verse that you should hold. try and remember this verse. These things we write, so the reason for what he has wrote in the previous verses is so that our joy may be made complete. So that uh, some um, translations say your, so, so, be, so that your joy may be made complete, and complete can mean full. So the reason for this, so that our joy may be made full. So let's look at the word joy. It won't come on the screen, but this is an important one. The word in the Greek is kara, and it means cheerfulness, or calm delight, or gladness, or exceedingly joy. <coughs> so if you put in the fellowship, the output is joy. Not just a partial joy. What does that say? It says a full, complete means full. So it's not a partial joy, it's semi-joy, it's full joy. Full joy. True joy 
and only be purchased with the blood of Jesus. Only a born again believer in Jesus can access this. The world and its pleasures cannot. The world will try and sell you joy, and it might feel good for the short term, but in the long term it will destroy you and won't, won't um, edify your soul. Only Jesus can give you the joy out of this world. The world cannot give you any um, understanding and long lasting joy. So thoughts regarding the may or the full, so the may and the full. So joy, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a fruit of the spirit, which means it needs to be practiced. Can you, can, the question I like to ask is, can you be a Christian without producing joy? Can you be a Christian and have zero percent joy? So I would say no, because if you have the spirit, then you will have joy all the time. That gift cannot be taken away. However, it won't always be full. If it was always full, John would John wouldn't write these verses one to four. So it's not always full, but it can be full. And John is giving us the remedy of how to, to uh, get a fullness of joy. And the analogy I'd like to try and give is with a car. So the drivers that are here, um, obviously you, you, your petrol tank you, have, you might have a number of miles remaining. So at what number do you get it to where you're like, I'm going to that petrol station? So some might be like 50. As soon as it's 50, I'm not going long distance, I'm going straight to the, to the petrol station. Some might be like 40, when it gets to 40, I'm going. Some could be brave and they might go 30, 20, <laughs> some might need to go to 10, and I would say that is a little bit daft uh, if you let it go that low. In the past, I think I've got to 9, and I was like, please let me get to I'm not saying go on some pros, but it went to 11. I'm like, how's it gone up when I've been driving? <laughs> but I'd say you'd be very daft if you leave it to get to very low, and I think we'd all agree that you would, wouldn't do that. So the question for us all is, how many miles is currently in your spiritual tank? Are you full and producing joy, or are you getting lower and lower, and maybe not too bothered about finding a petrol station? Maybe circumstances in life are draining your spiritual tank. Maybe, and to be super personal, maybe you fill up a little every Sunday, and by Wednesday, you're on the red light again, and you're stumbling over the line to the petrol station, which is here on a Sunday. So I want to. So we all, as a church family, this building isn't. Let me re rephrase that. Rephrase that. You cannot just get. This isn't the only petrol station. This is just walls. So how can you fill your spiritual tank? You can text a believer. You can ring a believer. You can read the Bible, you can pray, you can share the gospel, you can attend the church meeting in the week, you can listen to some worship music. So you don't just have to come here. This is a building. The church is each the believers in Jesus. So if you're getting super low in your spiritual tank, please do one of those things and be filled with joy. We need to have fellowship so that our joy may be made complete. <laughs> so we're going to move on to verse 5 now. Verse 5, we're going to go to verse 5, which says, This is the message which we have heard from him. Again, repetition, constant repetition in these verses. So, so John is not saying this is from tradition. It's not something that man has made up over time. But this is direct from the word of life, Jesus himself. So this is the message we have heard from him, Jesus, and announced to you was that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So an important note, other world religions were founded by men receiving special revelation from angels. However, 
were there any eyewitnesses at the scene? Can someone prove what these people said were true? Christianity is unique. Our faith is built upon the historical evidence of Jesus, from the people who saw him, from the people who followed him, John, Paul, Peter, James. They tell us about the word of life coming to earth, doing signs and wonders, and most importantly, rising from the dead. So that is what our faith is, is founding, is, is, we are founding on that truth. So let's look at the God is the light. So the verses won't come as but John 1 talks about the light. John 8, 12 reads, Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then it says, And in him, God, there is no darkness at all. God cannot have any darkness, otherwise he wouldn't be God. He is full, 100% truth and light. He is the truth. So we know that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. So now we go to verse 6. Verse 6. Now, a few of these verses said that if. So an if is a condition to have this way or that way. So hopefully you're going down, we're all going down the right way. So it says, if we say that we have fellowship, the same fellowship word before, that unity, that togetherness, that oneness, if we say we have fellowship with him, Jesus, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So the word walk is about practicing the truth. It's active word. It's not a one-time thing, it's Christian's life. And it says, walk in the darkness. So darkness, this is imagery for sin. Jesus is the light and he was sinless. So it's living a life that's contrary to his teachings. It's not about talking about sin. It's not talking about a sin even though it's a constant state of disobedience. We'll get to it in a second, we all sin, but this is be in that state of rebellion um, and just sinning and living a life that's not to, to Jesus' standards. So I would say, if this is you, we need to leave the darkness and return to a true fellowship or relationship with God with all the blessings I bring. So if you're in the darkness now, then you need to come into the light. Um, so what's the flip side of the darkness? So the flip side of the darkness, hopefully in verse 7, is being in the light. So we're going to look at verse 7 now. The flip side of the darkness. So the if, now this is the opposite. But if we walk in the light, so what is walking in the light? It's about being obedient to God's word. Trying, that's an important word, trying, because we never will in this world. Trying to be more like Jesus every day. It's not about perfection. I'm going to steal this quote from somebody because I, I, I like it when I listen to a sermon. He said, It's not about perfection or being sinless, it's about sinning less. So, not sinless, but sinning less. So, it says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, Jesus is the light. So what happens when you walk in the light and live in the light? It says, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. So this is another benefit of being in the light. It doesn't say you're washed of some sin or a sin that I might say is 7 out of 10 for badness or a 2 out of 10. It's not just the little sins. Not the big sins, he cleanses us from all sin. All sin means all sin. This is talking about sanctification and not salvation. Just a reminder, this is written to Christians. So it's not about salvation, it's about sanctification, which is the daily walk with Jesus. Um, salvation is a one time event by repenting and putting your faith in Jesus' work on the cross. This context is about the daily walk with God as a believer. 
It's about emptying yourself of your sin and being filled with the Spirit and having a continued fellowship with God and one another. And then the result of this is you're cleansed, so you should be joyful because that's what the verse 3 or 4 said before. So empty yourself, be in the darkness, empty yourself, come into the light, and then you're filled with joy. So it sounds super simple, and it is simple, but it's not, because obviously we're all, we all mess up, don't we? And sometimes we have guilt, but let's not have the guilt because it cleanses from all sin. So all sin, if God's forgot about it, so should we. Let's live a life of fullness, and of joy, and let's not, even, let's not condemn ourselves, let's empty of ourselves and forget about it because God has cleansed us of our sin. So we're going to look at verse 8 now, we've only got three more verses to get through so we fast. So we have three ifs, again if is this or that, so we're going to verse 8, verse 8. Verse 8 and 10 sound very similar and hopefully I'll try and explain what people say the differences, so it says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. And when they say no sin, it's talking about the nature, not about sins. So it's just sin there. So it's the nature of men and the fall. So it won't go on the screen, but Psalm 51 5, right there it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered in the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. We are all born with a sinful nature from Adam, and our fleshly nature leans towards sinful behaviour. No one has to teach my two kids to be naughty. They're just, they're just naughty in general. <laughs> But that is the truth, isn't it? We don't have to teach them to be honest, you just know because of that nature that we're all born into. So even though we're in the light and in fellowship with God, we cannot say that we have no sin, otherwise the truth is not in us. It's all about accountability and awareness. So let's not downplay certain sins that I mentioned before. So we could say, well, everybody does. <coughs> And you're trying to excuse your own sin. <coughs> we are sinners saved by God's grace. So that's about the sin nature of man. I'm going to skip a verse and go to verse 10, but it's still the next slide, Pete. So verse 10, then we'll come back to 9. So verse 10, so what's the difference? If we say that we have not sinned, so this is multiple sins, we make him, God, a liar, and his word, Jesus, is not in us. So, we cannot say we have not sinned, because Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, not even one. And it's quoting Psalm, which says, Psalm 40, There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Can any of us as Christians really say and believe that we don't sin or never sin. This is foundational to the Christian faith. All of us sin. All of us fall short. God, God cannot lie. So once we recognize our sinful nature and our sinfulness, so once we bring all those truths home, we have a sinful nature, we're sinners and we sin. We get verse 9. And this is one that you need to remember, and a lot of you probably will know this verse. So verse 9 is one to stir it down here. Verse 9 is one that we should probably wake up to and go to bed to. Verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So who does that want to be that? It's on me and you, it's not on God. The initial trigger is me and you. So the promise is if we as believers confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and righteous, and righteous like a judge, so he can dismiss if, if he has the right penalty has been brought forward, so Jesus' death and resurrection, he was happy with that. 
Um, and then it says to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't forget, not from some unrighteousness, not from little, big unrighteousness, from all, it's all sin, all sin and unrighteousness. So God is waiting with his hands out to forgive you and me as believers. And in turn, that restores you into the glorious light, <coughs> which makes your joy full. Verse 4 says, These things we write so that our joy may be made full. And as we do the breaking of bread, as Gareth does the breaking of bread in a minute, this is the fellowship, this is that deep word that I was talking about. This is where we reflect upon ourselves and what Jesus has done for us. This is the light. Darkness doesn't have any place in this. So let's have a prayer in a second and inwardly, if we all remove the sins from our lives, it's that isn't it when we try and hide sins because God is all knowing and all seeing him. So little old Jamie can't hide his sins. So it's that to even think we can hide. So let's just Let's just understand ourselves, we fall short daily. Chapter 2 starts going on to say that basically we all will sin. If you say you won't sin again, then you're a liar because we all will sin daily, hence what we've read. So let's get rid of our sins to God, confess, and then let's be filled with joy. Um, so let's grab hold of this truth and let's leave here this morning full of joy because what Jesus has done in our lives. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, you need to repent of your sins and believe what Jesus did the cross, that he died for your sins and rose again the third day so we could have eternal life and we can be sure that when we will die in this body, we will rise from dead in heaven. And then you, you are in God's family and you receive all the blessings and you'll be in heaven one day, which is ultimately the, the eternal destination for a believer. So let's just have a quick prayer. I'll pray aloud and then let's just pray in our hearts before we do this. Lord, as we read your word, we, we read your word is truth. So your word makes it clear what we need to do as believers. Lord, let's just bring all our sins to you. It's not like a checklist, I've done this, I've done that. It's just about re a realisation, Lord, we fall short, we sin, I shouldn't have done that. Lord, if you want us to be full, you want us to be joyful, and you're waiting for us to be restored to you with a sense of joy and peace. Lord, remove the sins from our lives, let us realise that we're fallen people, and let us be filled and realise what Jesus has done for us on the cross. He did something that we could never do. And as we do the bread and the, and the wine this morning, we realise that your death on the cross was a perfect sacrifice. When you look at your children, you do see perfection. And we thank you for what you did on the cross and your promises that one day this body will be, will have a new body and will be in heaven one day. But until that day, Lord, as a church, we have a job to do. We have a, a witness to people, like John said, he declared to people. So I pray, Lord, that you will put something in our hearts, a desire to want to tell other people uh, about the glorious gospel of Jesus. So settle our hearts and let us be filled with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching all. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, consider subscribing so that you'll be notified when we add new videos. Thank you, God bless, take care, bye.